Good morning, everyone. Um, as Jeff mentioned, my name is Gage Tunji. I'm a partner at Lieber Cassidy Whitmore. It's a pleasure to be here working with CSAC on this webinar. And my understanding is we have actually a mix of both counties and cities that are on this webinar today. So it's a pleasure to uh, be of assistance to you. So we have a new public sector employee orientation law. And the reason you're on here is you're wondering, what does this mean to me? How did we get here? What's going on? And what we're going to try to do roughly in the next 45 minutes or so, and it's going to give you an overview of kind of what this new law is, how we got here, what it entails. And then towards the back end, we're going to try to answer your questions to address things. I will, as a caveat, point out, this is a brand new law. There are a lot of uncertainties that are out there, and we're still doing our best to try to get a sense of how this is going to play out. So you want to stay tuned because we'll also find out more in the coming weeks about how, for example, the Public Employment Relations Board, PERB, will implement part of these things, how some of this will be interpreted, and you're going to find out from your own employee associations and unions how it's going to address the orientations that you do for your new employees. So that's going to be kind of the fun we're going to talk about here for the next 45 minutes. I can tell you're jazzed, you're pumped up, you're excited for new laws, and that's what we're going to be doing. Um, so first of all, what's the brief introduction? What is this law? It's AB 119. It's a, it's a part of what we call a budget trailer bill. The state passed its budget here by its deadline of June 15th, um, and they have trailer bills that go along with this. These bills, when signed by the governor, go into effect immediately. This bill was called Assembly Bill 119. Um, and it was signed by the governor on June 27th. So the laws that we're talking about have gone into effect now. One other thing I should point out, most of you that, that registered ahead of time, we do have a white sheet that was either emailed to you or that you can download, my understanding, from um, the webinar that you're on right now. Kind of gives you a summary of the laws, some questions and answers, and it actually gives you the text of the government code sections that are affected. So it's just a good resource to kind of you know, take from this as well to see how this law is going to play out. But the law now went into effect June 27th. Two main issues. One, when you do a new employee orientation, you need to be able to provide access one way or another to your employee associations, to your unions, those recognized employee associations. However, the mechanism, we'll all go into this a little bit later, is you have to meet and confer over doing that. And if you can't agree, it goes into what's called binding interest arbitration, which means the third party will make the decision if you can't agree otherwise. The second part of this law is also the fact that now any time that we have new employees who are hired, we have to provide information, contact information, work address, even home, personal, phone numbers, email addresses that we have on these individuals to your employee associations um, in every 30 days from the date of hire, and then at least every 120 days to update those if there's any updates for all your employees. Now, why are we have these two things? Let's give a history of why we're here with AB 119, why we, how we got here. Basically, the main issue involves what's going on in a more broader level at the federal courts, the United States Supreme Court. In California and in other states that have collective bargaining rights for uh, their public employees, California here we have what's called agency shop, where you can have the ability under the myers millius brown Act and other, other state uh, labor relations statutes, but for the agencies here it's the myers millius brown Act, the MMPA. You have the ability to set up an agency shop. And what that means is, and there's a government code section, 3502.5, you can set up a means where if it's voted on by the members or approved by your agency, everyone has to pay what's either an agency fee or they become a member of the employee association or union. There's a big question whether that's constitutional under the United States Constitution. And there was a big case that came out last year that was going to decide this, we thought, once and for all. It's called Fredericks versus the California Teachers Association. That was getting ready to be decided, it had been argued, and there was one big hiccup along the way. Justice Antonin Scalia, who was on the United States Supreme Court, passed away. So what that meant was, because there was not a new justice who was appointed, and he had already had the case be heard, it was actually decided 4-4. And if a case is decided 4-4, that means the lower court ruling applies, nothing's overturned, and what happened is, then, therefore, agency shop agreements were still upheld. The reason why this is kind of interesting, though, is there was a case even before then, back in 2014, called Harris versus Quinn. For those counties that are on this call, or on this webinar, this may be rele uh, relevant to the extent you have what's called IHSS workers, or in-home support service workers. And the United States Supreme Court said you can't enforce or compel agency shop circumstances, which means that everyone, whether they're a union member, association member or not, has to pay those fees. So the thought was that that was, it was very, very limited in scope, the Harris v. Quinn case, but the thought was this Fredericks case versus CTA was going to broaden that. And why is that a big issue? The big issue is when you have agency shop, these are fees that go to employee associations and unions, and that's what, in essence, funds them. 
If that gets taken away and public employees have the right to choose whether or not they want to pay those fees, that could have a severe financial blow to those associations. Um, so as a result, this is where we started to see this issue of employee orientation bills. Prior to that Frederick's case last year, there was a really big push for a similar bill to mandate that an employee orientations, the unions, employee associations that are recognized have a right to go and meet with the employees or be part of that process. Um, there were a lot of open questions about how this was going to be done, but once the Frederick's case was decided 4-4 and didn't change anything, it kind of died down. The reason why this got revived and why we're here back here again today and why we now actually do have a law in effect here with AB 119 is because now with the new Trump administration, he appointed Neil Gorsuch, who's now on the Supreme Court, probably puts that, um, you would assume, 5-4 kind of tilt more towards the conservative way if a new case was to come. There's a good argument in a case like a Fredericks versus CTA, it'd probably be ruled in favor of saying things like agency shop are unconstitutional for public employees. Therefore, that pushes the issue here that, hey, we need to make sure that employee associations, unions, um, have the right to be able to um, interact with their members, with new employees, be aware of what the value of being a member of those associations is. That's kind of the push behind this bill. Um, what's interesting about it, though, I think, and we'll kind of go into how this, this bill plays out here, I think the interesting part, though, is most of your agencies is very greatly. We have a number of different agencies, counties. We have some more urban counties, rural counties. In cities, for example, agencies that are impacted by this, there is not a one-size-fits-all that does new employee orientations. Um, some of your agencies get everyone into a, a meeting room once a month if you're a new employee and they do a broad scope. Some do it online. Some do it one-on-one -on -one with an HR rep. Um, so in orientations itself, this bill kind of presumes it's done in a one-size-fits-all kind of circumstance. But that's really not the case. I think that's the part that's going to be interesting to see how this plays out and what the impacts are because that's not so clear cut. Some of your agencies may already have employee orientations where you provide access to unions. If that's the case, more likely than not, you're not gonna have as many issues, you're probably gonna follow those same processes. But for those that don't have that, this is what the, this bill now means. The first part is, if you do any new employee orientations, you have to give, whether it's a recognized union, recognized employee association, 10 days notice, of their ability or of when the new employer orientation is going to be. The part that's a little bit murky after that though is that the law says they have a right to attend or be a part of those new employer orientations, but we have to meet and confer, which is your collective bargaining, to decide how that's going to be. And what the court said is that we're looking at what's called structure, time, and manner. Those are the phrases that they, that, excuse me, that the legislature used in, in this new law, that we have to have the structure, time, and manner to meet and confer over this. And that's very broad. Now, how do you do that? Well, you mean confer just like you do for successor memorandums of understanding. You mean confer over other terms and conditions of employment. You sit down with the union, you sit down with the employee association, you share proposals, and you strive to reach an agreement. So what this means is, is that if we have to do these new employee orientations and the union says we want to have access and you don't have an agreement or process otherwise, you have to meet and confer over doing that. Now, the interesting part about this law is how that process plays out. So the union requests to meet and confer, the employee association requests to meet and confer, you sit down and meet. If you can't reach an agreement um, at that time, and you're looking at, in a, in a sense, if we can't meet and confer, you know, and we meet, reach an agreement within 45 to 60 days, um, 45 days of the first meeting or six days of the initial request to negotiate, which kind of implies you never meet or you stall out of time, then they can request to go and request to PERB to go to what's called binding interest arbitration. But let me step back for a second and go to what do we meet and confer over? And I think this is important. In our white paper, we kind of cover this, but there's a few different things when you're thinking about what is it that we're going to talk about in terms of how we have to meet and confer over the structure, the time, and the manner. And you have to love these great phrases that the legislature comes up with because then it turns out the courts oftentimes have to interpret this. Here's what this means. When we talk about structure, time, and manner, structure being this. To what degree is the employee rep going to be present? At what time? Um, how much time are they going to be given? Is, the, you know, is there any kind of limitations on what they can say? You can see, for example, why a public agency may not want to have um, a you know, you recognized union or employee association show up at orientation and badmouth the agency, as opposed to talking about what membership is and other types of things. So it's not so clear cut. Those are things that may be brought up in your negotiations, the content of what's going to be you know, applied. Here's another one, whether or not those employees have to be present. Is it compelled? Um, one of the big questions that came up in the legislative process of AB 119, it's not directly stated in the statute, but 
the legislature and the governor acknowledge this is that is that paid release time. You're, usually your employee orientations are during paid time because we are compelling them to be there. But if the, if the union's present during that time making the presentation, whatever that structure, time and manner is, how does that apply? Um, and we have to compel the employees to be there. That's probably another issue that's going to come up. Um, or probably the other thing is in terms of structure, time and manner, it's also going to look at how does your agency do these orientations. For example, maybe you don't do a meeting. I don't think this law compels you to have to do an in-person meeting with each employee or broader group. But if you do do, for example, an online orientation, or perhaps your orientation is in a packet of information, the union or the employee association may want to meet and confer about, hey, we have a handout we want to include in there. It talks about union membership or how that applies. These are the kind of things that will be discussed. Now, the other part that's interesting is some of you may think, well, gosh, we already have a current memorandum of understanding in place. We have an MOU in place. We've already finished our negotiations. Maybe it took a long time, and you're finally there, and you're locked down. Does this mean that we have to reopen up our new contract, reopen up every other thing? The answer is no. The legislature said in this bill that only for this limited purpose of employee orientation access do you have to meet and confer. Whether you open up your MOU to add this there, or whether or not you do a side letter or an amendment, that's going to be between the parties, but it doesn't compel you to have to talk about anything else. So for example, to meet and confer, the union says, hey, we'll agree to do this so long as you give us 3% of wages, you can say, no, we're not talking about that. This is already a closed up um, MOU. We don't have to deal with that issue. It's limited in scope. So that's kind of the meet and confer process. And I think what's going to be interesting about how this plays out in the meet and confer process is you know, the different types of issues and how they apply to the different types of orientations or information that you provide to your new employees. As I mentioned, probably the biggest thing issue I, I'm, going to, I'm going to see for most of the public agencies that we work with really is this concept of, how do you balance this kind of one-size-fits-all kind of outlook of this bill versus the fact that it's not a one-size-fits-all employee orientations among your agencies? And I think that's where we're going to see a little bit more of the conflict. But going to the second part, let's say we don't agree, and that goes back within 45 days of your first meeting or 60 days of, a, of an employee um, association or union's request to meet over new employee orientations. If you don't reach agreement, then Either party, and more likely than not, it's probably going to be the, the recognized union or employer organization, They're, they can request to submit the matter of what's called binding interest arbitration. This is really a game changer. Usually, this is the concept of meaning we go to impasse. We have not agreed. And for those that have done MOU negotiations, when you reach impasse, if you're familiar with the, the MMBA statutes for most of you, what happens is, you reach impasse, if you agree to bring in a mediator, you can do that, or you can request what's called, the union can request what's called fact-finding, and then a report's done, it's non-binding, but at the end of the day, any decisions that are made to unilaterally impose are going to fall on your governing body, being your board of supervisors, being your city councils, or board of directors for special districts. Um, they make the final decision, not someone else, they do. And you can also agree not to make a decision or not. Binding interest arbitration is a concept that says not your board of supervisors, not your city council, board of directors, governing body, they don't make the decision. Rather, it's going to be a third party arbitrator who's going to make the decision. It's kind of an interesting concept. It's something that we saw actually a few years back. The legislature tried to compel this for safety groups, police and fire groups. Um, when they had their MOU negotiations, that went to the courts. The courts found that to be unconstitutional because it delegated authority to an outside party. Now, some of the parties that are on this call may be what we call charter counties or charter cities, that as part of their charter, they've agreed to do interest arbitration. I know a lot of agencies, charter agencies, have gone away from that in the last few years, but that may be part of your rules. If you agree to do it, that's fine. This, by law, compels that this issue of employee orientation policies, that structure, time, and manner, is going to be agreed upon by an outside party if you and your union, you and your employee association cannot agree otherwise. So that's very different. That's very interesting. So what ends up going to be is going to happen is so if you reach that 45 days from the first meeting, 60 days from when the request to meetings made, and it's a short time frame on purpose because either you're going to agree to this or you're not, and or it's going to go to interest arbitration. What happens is you make a request to PERB, that's the Public Employees Relation Board, um, or Public Employment Relations Board, excuse me. PERB then would give you a list of, of arbitrators. These are kind of the same arbitrators that you may see for things like discipline arbitrations or grievance arbitrations. And you would do a strike, a, a, you know, if you can't agree on one, you would strike from the list or approval will select it. And then based on that, that person's going to be making that final decision. So that's in a 
versus a third party, not part of what you do, and that's out there. Now, there is, a, as one kind of approach that does apply to counties and cities, there is kind of a very, very limited exception that if you object to using an arbitrator, instead you can request that you have a PERB officer, a PERB ALJ, administrative law judge, they act as the arbitrator. And if we do that, you have to pay the full cost as opposed to splitting the cost with the union. Um, still, even then, if, whether it's a per person or an arbitrator, it's still a third party. And I think it's kind of interesting to see it's a different approach we haven't seen in a while, one that was found unconstitutional for an entire memorandum of understanding, but yet is now being applied for this concept of employee orientation. The idea from the legislature is you can't just not agree. Um, if you don't, someone else is going to agree to make that policy for you, and you're going to be stuck with it when it applies. So that's going to be something that's a little bit different structure. And what would happen is you, you, there would be a meeting with the interest arbitrator that presents both sides. Um, the, the city or county, for example, would present where, where their proposals are. The employee association, the union presents theirs. And the interest arbitrator doesn't have to pick one or the other. They can actually craft something based on what those are. So they're given actually a broad power um, as a third party to make that decision. And if they make that decision, it's final and binding, at least as written by this legislation. Um, so it's kind of a different, very, very different, you know, uh, animal there and something we haven't seen very much. And as I mentioned, part of this as well, because this is a brand new law, even though now it's in effect as of June 27th, there's a lot of kind of moving parts here, such as what's PERB's role? How is PERB going to take in these requests? Are they just going to use the list of arbitrators that they have for other types of matters or for fact-finding? More likely than not, that's probably what they'll do. Um, if we request that a PERB ALJ makes that decision, um, for example, who's available to do that. We're going to have to see how PERB responds to this new law because they're in the same boat we are, getting, a, getting a, in essence a mandate from the legislature that now has to be followed. Um, but keeping that in mind, though, I think that's kind of what the nuts and bolts of this law really is, and it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Practically speaking, what does this mean for your agencies? A few things. One, you want to take a look at what are we doing right now, if anything, to allow our unions allow our recognized employee associations um, to have access to new employee orientations. If you are doing that, the law says, so long as it's not inconsistent with this law, maybe we do something greater, we, we provide access, and your unions have no, have no problem doing that, they don't have an issue, you carry on business as usual. If not, we do not have not provided this, then we're waiting to see if your union or employee association makes a request to get that access. For some agencies, this may not be a big thing. Some of you may have employee associations or unions who really don't aren't as concerned about you know, being part of the employee orientation. Others may have more of a of a you know, vested you know, right to think that they should be part of that because they want to increase their membership or increase their awareness. That's going to vary agency by agency. We are not per se obligated, you know, just just because of today, to go out and talk to the union and say what we're we doing here. We can wait for them to ask us how that applies. What we can do, though, is um, what, we, what we are obligated to do, though, this part is mandatory as of today, is when you have those new employee orientations, you have to give that 10 days notice to the affected employee organizations about to make sure they're aware of that. And if that's going to move down the, the line to have to meet and confer to figure out what that structured time and manner is over what, how you're going to allow access, that may happen. It's not entirely clear from this law how exactly if we can we still do our new employee orientations if we haven't completed meeting and referring and I think that's going to be a judgment call on your agencies we can't wait around for new employees not to be made aware of how they're going to work so that's another kind of you know different aspect that I think is going to be interesting to see how that plays out you're going to have to make a judgment call there but regardless give the 10 days notice and then if you have to meet and confer to create a policy um, create a practice that structure time and manner of how you're going to provide access to those employee associations and unions that are asking for it, then we can address that when it comes up, and that's what you should be looking to do. So what are some unknowns otherwise? I mentioned earlier this concept of binding interest arbitration is one that the Court of Appeal here in California twice actually has found to be unconstitutional because it delegates a decision-making authority of a local agency to a, a, a non, an interested third party, being someone who's not part of that agency takes that away once again from your board of supervisors, takes that away from your city councils, board of directors that are governing bodies that are there. Um, and this kind of comes down to, there's a specific article of the state constitution, Article 11, Section 11A, which says the legislature may not delegate to a private person or body power to make, control, appropriate, supervise, 
or interfere with county or municipal corporation improvements, money, or property, or to levy taxes or assessments, or perform municipal functions. Now, are we arguing over wages or things? We're not. And that was probably something that was a bigger thing um, back when the Court of Appeal looked at, I think it was called SB 440, which involved police and fire safety units and buying interest arbitration. All we're talking about here is employee orientation, but still it takes away the, the power of your governing bodies to make that decision to whether to agree or impose otherwise or refuse to agree on that type of issue. From what we understand from, from the, the, the governor's position, the legislature's position, they feel that this is constitutional because it doesn't involve things like wages. It's more of a limited scope issue. And if, if any of your agencies choose to, to go to court to challenge it, I guess we'll wait and see if that does apply. <clears throat> but that constitutionality aspect of it, I think, is something that's kind of an open question if someone chooses to, to challenge it. But in the meantime, until we see a court order or something otherwise, this law is in effect. We have to follow it. And we would have to follow the buy-in interest arbitration aspect of it unless someone challenges it in court. So that's kind of the, the main other you know, issue that's there. And let me just talk one last part I mentioned very, very briefly is the other aspect of this law is that it does require that um, within 30 days of the date of hire that you provide the name, job title, department, work location, contact information. It's very broad. Work, home, personal, cell phones, personal email addresses if you know the home address of any newly hired employee within the bargaining unit, whether they're a member of the, of the employee association or union or not. Um, there was a case decided by the California Supreme Court a few years ago, it was called uh, County of Los Angeles versus um, the Los Angeles uh, LA ERCOM, which is their kind of per um, organization for the County of Los Angeles. And in that case, there was a big debate about whether or not those who are non-union members were part of the bargaining unit if they have a right to privacy, not to have that information disseminated. And the California Supreme Court said no. Typically there is a right to privacy, but your employee associations, your unions, they have the ability and they have a more of a vested right to have that information, so to speak, or a compelling interest, probably a better way of saying that, because they're there to represent employees. Which means that whether your employees want to get information from the union or the employee association or not, they're going to get that. This is now codified in this new part of AB 119. Um, and that's in the government code now. Um, we have to now provide that information. You do within 30 days of hire. But then the other part, not just for your new hires, is for all employees. They can get that information. You have to provide it to your unions or employee associations. We're updated every 120 days. In a lot of ways, this is not a brand new thing. Um, frankly, if employee associations or unions can ask for that information, some of them have a standing request for things like this. At some agencies, this may not be brand new. They probably have already had the right to this information under the MMBA. This just codifies more of a process and timelines for when that must be provided. So that's the other kind of, uh, doesn't directly relate to, relate to employee orientation, but relates to providing contact information to provide other means for your recognized unions, recognized employee associations to reach out and communicate um, with those bargaining unit members, whether they're a union member or not. So that's the other aspect of it. So that's kind of the quick summary of this law. Um, and I'm sure we probably have some fun questions. As I mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty that's out there. Um, but I think what I'm going to try to do here for the remaining time is open up to whatever questions we have, Jeff, and, and see what I can do my best to answer it. Keep in mind, we're still trying our best to, to figure out all the new ins and outs of this law, too. And there's a lot of uncertainty uh, based on how it's written. Great. Thank you, Gage. Um, we do have a number of questions here. And as you say, I think they are fun. Um, so let's start with, um, we'll go pretty much in order, um, except that I'll read the, the last one first. Um, there was a moment uh, in your presentation where the audio cut out just for a couple of seconds okay. um, when you were speaking about uh, the employer's obligation to reach out to unions or wait until requested. So can you go over that? Real quick again. Yeah, no, sorry about that for the audio trouble. So, so what the law does require is prior to 10 days before your new employee orientation, or within 10 days, or at least 10 days notice, excuse me, we do have to provide notice to your recognized union, to recognize employee associations that you are going to have a new employee orientation. Whether or not they want to be there, or be part of that, um, this law in essence says they have a right to do that, but then you have to meet and confer. Um, over what they call the structured time and manner of that. So in that circumstance, then that, that's 
could take a while. You're probably going to take longer than just that new employee orientation that you're probably going to have to have happen. Some of your agencies hire new employees all the time. You're doing orientations maybe even on a, gosh, daily, weekly, you know, monthly basis. Um, I don't think we don't have to keep doing those orientations, but we still have to do our obligation to meet and confer. You're going to eventually have to, whether you, you reach that conclusion through agreement or through the decision of an interest arbitrator, um, that conclusion is going to, going to have to you know, create a policy at some point where that access will be provided. So if the current MOU has language on union participation in new employee orientation, do you have to renegotiate access? Not necessarily. Now, the, this is an area of the law that's not entirely clear, but what it does say is if you already have in your MOUs, your area of agreements about orientation that are either equal to or in essence or greater than what's provided in this law, um, which would in essence be providing some sort of, of access to your orientation means. I, I've seen agencies where they have uh, the uh, union rep can come and talk for 10, 20, 30 minutes, things like that that's in the MOU. They've already negotiated that. If, assuming that's consistent with this law, we do not have to renegotiate those things. Um, if for some reason we provide access, but it's not as, um, uh, or maybe it's, it's more restrictive, um, it's not as open as this law would kind of appear to, to, uh, to invite, then it's possible that, that they could meet and confer over that and ask for more access. Um, that part's not really clear. I'll give you a great example of this. I mean, I know some agencies will say, hey, we have an MOU, the employee union can come at the end of the meeting. We don't compel the employees to be there. They may leave. And um, if people want to stick around, they can do that. You can talk to them. You know, and you, you may have that union now say, hey, based on this AB 119, we actually can get greater access. So we want to meet and confirm more over that. That may compel a need to do that. Um, it's just something that's not entirely clear. And, and if that happens, and if, if we don't agree to allow that, then what you're going to be looking at is probably an unfair practice charge in front of PERB. And we'd have to have PERB weigh in as to what that obligation is. So this one kind of gets to the base of the whole thing. Um, there's one person who wrote in saying that they are an agency shop, so employees must contribute. Are they therefore exempt from any of the provisions of this act? No, and you're not. Um, great question. I know I gave that kind of history of that agency shop, this concept of public employees is kind of under attack at the U.S. Supreme Court and the federal courts from a constitutional standpoint. But um, no, this applies to everyone regardless of whether you have agency shop or not. So you may have an agency shop and you don't provide access for employer orientations. This would apply to your agency as well. You have the same obligations whether you're an agency shop uh, bargain unit or not. So you already answered the first part of the next question, which is that if the employee asks the city not to give out the personal information, can the employee refuse to give that information to the association? Then you indicate that that's not the case. You're required to give out um, the new employee's information to the association. Um, but the other part of the question is, can the employee waive their right to the employee orientation by the association? Actually, it's a great question. So if I understand correctly, you know, if we have a new employee and they're at the employee orientation and they don't want to sit through the part where the union representative is there, can they walk out or not be part of that? A great question. Um, I think a lot of that depends on going to, once again, that structured time and manner of how, the, uh, how you've agreed to provide access to the union. Um, I don't think that we can compel them to be there. And if someone leaves and, and we say, well, you have to come back, because maybe, maybe the union rep presents in the middle, but yet we need that person to be back for the second part of the presentation that's provided by your agency. Um, that's something that you guys are going to have to do from an operational standpoint. I don't think we can compel someone to be there if they don't want to, um, like a captive audience kind of thing, I guess, if I call it that. But then again, you know, you're going to have to look at how you, how you pr provide your orientations and how you're going to address that scenario if it arises. We have a couple of different questions that are variations on this. Um, this particular agency has 18 different unions representing 23 bargaining units. So is each union entitled to individual time, or can it just be one time slot for unions to meet with employees in their own bargaining unit? Now, this is a great question. One of the, I think, the biggest problems that, that and this is even last year when there was the employer orientation bill, I mentioned this concept of one size you know, fits all, is kind of how the legislature has looked at this. What, what you all know, you know, at local agencies that are on this webinar is that's just not practically speaking how it works. A lot of your agencies have, for example, I think this is 18 unions, 23 bargaining units. You may have one big new employee orientation. 
So to have the, the unions be present, would you then split off into, eight, into 18 different rooms and then have them you know, be able to provide access that way? It's not really quite clear. That's probably something you'd have to negotiate and bargain for. Um, is it easier to provide a handout instead because of that scenario, which is because it's not practical to um, you know, have each of the unions be present? And how are you going to be able to have them give their information? Or do we want them to all go at once and provide information, but yet they're providing it in a, in a, in a big group that yet doesn't include uh, people that are part of that union? It doesn't really make sense. Those are issues that actually would probably come up in your meet confer um, discussions as you try to find an appropriate means to provide that access. Um, that's what's really unique about this law is that it's kind of what the legislature's way of saying, well, we want to make sure that, that our unions that are employee associations have access to their employees, but we're going to leave it up to you to decide to do that. But if you can't decide to do that, a third party is going to make the decision for you. That's really a nutshell of what this law is about. But the practicality of that, and depending on your labor relations too, I mean, think about this. There's some agencies out there that may be, have good labor relations. You have a contract in place, for example. Um, things are going well. There's some agencies out there that may not have contracts or MOUs in place. You're still in negotiations. Maybe you're at impasse over things like wages. And this is going to be another issue tacked on to what's already a, a, probably a rather contentious set of negotiations and not good labor relations with those affected unions and bargaining units. So is that going to make it easier? They, they may ask for things that are unreasonable as part of this employee orientation. Well, if it goes to that interest arbitrator or if you choose to opt to have a per bail J, or a perb officer or otherwise make that decision, I guess those are the things that, that are going to have to be decided upon. Problem is when you go to a buying interest arbitrator, or even this, this kind of perb exception, it's still a third party, it's an outside group that's going to be making that decision for you. And they have, according to this law, a lot of leeway as to how to make that decision. But you're going to be making the arguments about why those circumstances, things like having 18 unions, 23 bargains, how you're going to be able to, to manage that and what's practical or not. Hopefully that would help make a case for your agency to do something that, that, that matches that as opposed to something unreasonable being offered by those associations. What is interesting though is that technically speaking you would be negotiating not unless you chose to, which I guess would probably not be precluded, but you'd be negotiating with each of those unions or each of those bargaining units, not necessarily with as a, a jointly unless you agree otherwise to do that. So another question says that there are times when uh, an agency needs to hire an employee as soon as possible, and the and the employee orientations are scheduled less than 10 days out. So how does the law affect this practice? Now, there is an exception that's in the law that states, and this is in, let me get to it here, this is in the handout that you can download here. It says all the statutes that are in there, but it, where this talks about the 10 days notice, which is Government Code Section 3556, um, it says the exclusive representative shall receive not less than 10 days notice in advance of an orientation, except that a shorter notice may be provided in a specific instance where there is an urgent need critical to the employer's operations that was not reasonably foreseeable. That kind of applies to that scenario. So if you can articulate that, that we do a quick hire, we still didn't do a quick orientation as part of this, that wasn't able to give 10 days notice, that's going to be on your agency to, to, to justify that, but there is a means we're not stuck with the 10 days notice entirely. So it does have some flexibility there. So what happens if some of the unions agree to a structure and time and place and manner, but other unions have different and competing demands? Well, great question, Jeff. That's the fun of this new law, especially I know there's the one agency that has 23 bargaining units and 18 different unions. You're going to be negotiating individually with each of those unions and each of those employee associations. And so you may have some, and, and I'll, I'll give you a great example. I mean, I, I do labor negotiations. I've done labor relations and advise clients on this. you have been an attorney now for almost 14 years. Spent the last uh, 11 plus doing this. You know, there are some of those groups that are out there that are really easy going. Some may not care very much. For example, some of your safety groups, like a DSA, a Deputy Sheriff's Association, a POA, these guys have very strong union membership. Um, everyone joins, or pretty close to everyone, very, very high. They may not care as much about the employee orientations. And you have you know, your perhaps general units, maybe they're represented by groups like SCIU, AFSCME, these kind. These are the groups that are pushing this bill, and they're going to be the ones that are pushing to have some sort of access because perhaps they have larger groups where they're really trying to maximize their membership. Um, there's nothing that we can do to make all of the, the unions, so to speak, be on the same page as to what that access is. However, let's say, for example, um, that you've reached agreement with most of your units and you provide a means, a mechanism for them to be at these orientation meetings, they get a certain number of minutes, they get to provide certain amounts of information, 
and we have one holdout group, and that holdout group goes to buying interest arbitration, I, I would think that it would be a compelling interest to say this is what we do for every other group. Every other group's agreed to that because the buying interest arbitrator, I should mention this, they're going to look at a few different things, and this is what they're charged with looking at. The arbitrator shall consider a way and be guided by the following criteria. And this is noted in Government Code Section 3557. They're going to look at this, the ability of the exclusive rep to communicate with the public employees represents, the legal obligations of the exclusive representative to the public employees, state, federal, and local laws that are applicable to the employer, stipulations of the parties, I mean, that's where we've agreed on certain things already, the interest and welfare of the public and financial condition of the agency, structure, time, and manner of access of an exclusive representative to a new employer orientation in comparable public agencies, I meaning they're going to look at what are other agencies doing, I would argue also what your other bargaining units are doing, um, including those access provisions that are enabled to use your collective bargaining agreements, um, the legislature's findings, and then any other facts that are normally or traditionally taken into consideration in establishing the structure, time, and manner of access of an exclusive representative to that new employer orientation. These are very similar for those who are in fact finding to what those fact finding factors that a fact finding panel looks at. So that's not binding, this one is. So, you know, in that kind of scenario, that's kind of the argument you're going to have to make that if you can't reach agreement, and I'm sure that's going to happen for some of our agencies that are out there for a number of reasons, some of which may have nothing to do with employer orientation as opposed to just the status of your current labor relations. Then those are the things you want to make sure and try to justify from your standpoint from where your proposal is. So we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to get to as many of the questions as I can. I am, for the time being, going to skip most of the ones that say we have a lot of unions, how are we going to deal with this? Because that is a common concern. Um, but what if the association does not want access to the employee orientation? No, and that's totally fine. This is, as I mentioned, all your technically your minim, minimal obligation is just to provide notice as to what um, that the employee orientations are going on. Beyond that, to the extent that, that, the person, that these groups want to have access, you have to meet and confer. If they don't request that, and they don't ask to be there, I'd argue they waive that, and that's, we can't, this is, does not compel them to be there if they choose not to. But it does provide them a right to, pursuant to whatever we collectively bargain or what's decided upon by an interest arbitrator or a per ALJ um, for that purpose. So if you, you I, I, it won't surprise me that for some of your agencies, you may have, especially like employee associations that are, um, maybe do supervisory management employees, as I mentioned, some of your public safety groups, groups that, that traditionally, you know, you may have higher uh, levels of membership. Um, someone mentioned earlier, we already have agency shops, so maybe that's not as much of a concern for some of those groups. You may not see this be an issue. Um, but I think probably for your, my, my hunch is for your miscellaneous groups, your general units, um, and some of these other groups, you're probably going to see more of a push to have that request. They're not obligated to um, and if they don't want to, that's their, that's their prerogative, but if they do, we have to meet and confer with them. We have to set that process together and agree on it, or it's going to be decided by that interest arbitrator or that per ALJ. So for the employee information to be provided within 30 days and updated every 120 days, is that required to be provided without prompting from the union or only upon their request? No, actually, the way this is written, this is this puts a mandate on public agencies to do that. Prior to this, as I mentioned, most of this information was information that the union or employee association could request, and if they did, we'd be obligated to provide. This now, as it's codified, and that's Government Code Section 3558, this mandates this um, unless you have a di different agreement otherwise. I mean, for example, if, I, if a group says, hey, we don't need this every 120 days, and you give it to us once a year, and I would codify that in writing somewhere, then you're, you should be sufficient doing that. Otherwise, though, you're obligated to provide this information under those timelines. Uh, so here's somebody I think is clarifying. So the, is it true that the law only requires providing employee information that will be specifically represented by each specific union? So if the position is not covered by the union, the employee information doesn't need to be provided to that union? No, that's correct. And, and so you're only providing information um, for the, for the employees in the affected bargaining unit. Not for all account, like accounting employees or all city employees. So for example, let's say that we have um, a DSA unit, um, Deputy Sheriff's Association, and we just hired 10 deputy sheriffs, and there's also, I don't know, 120 deputy sheriffs that, that are part of that association otherwise. What this new law require is within 30 days of hire, we have to provide that contact information as I specified on those two 10 new hires 
but then every 120 days we have to provide an updated list if there are updates on the contact information for the whole group, only within the DSA, um, as an example. So it's only by the affected bargaining unit, not for all employees. But, it, but what it does mean is not just for people who, who are quote unquote members of the DSA versus bargaining unit members who choose not to be members because they're still part of that same bargaining unit. So, so whoever's part of that, um, that's the information that has to be provided. So this agency has an MOU that has an opt-out provision for home address. So will that still apply? If you have a, an agreement in place as to how that's going to be impacted and that's there, you sh I believe you should be able to, to, uh, to follow that. Um, because I'm looking, just looking at the statute here. Yeah, well, I don't know. Actually, it's a good question. Because what it does say is you have to provide information for all, all employees in the bargaining unit at least every 120 days unless more frequent or more detailed lists are required by an agreement with the exclusive representative. I mean, there could be an argument there that, you know, based on that, this would supersede even a less restrictive agreement or agreement that allows opt-outs. Um, perhaps under uncertainty there, I would, I would run a set of caution and say you have to provide that information in whole. So this next question is a pretty good one. How does the confidentiality of a sworn officer's address and phone information play into this new law? And if that information, it, it varies. If there is any kind of confidentiality provision or things, this is not, keep in mind we're not dealing with um, a Public Records Act request or anything. This is actually information that, that's being requested um, uh, by a recognized employee association. If there are confidentiality concerns or things like that, then that you know, may have to be looked at. Um, there is an issue that does note here in that government code section that the information shall be provided in a manner consistent with section 6254.3 um, and with section 6207 for a participant uh, at the address confidentiality program if, that, if there is something like that. So that's to be researched further. That's really probably only going to apply um, in those circumstances, you know, mostly to your, your peace officers or others, so there, there may be some issues there. But keep in mind that doesn't, it's not going to be an outright preclusion to provide that information to your recognized, like a DSA, for example, POA for police officers, because they're, they're not the public that we're, we're providing this to. They're the exclusive bargaining representative. It is 1145. We have a number of good questions left here. Um, I want to be respectful of people's time on the webinar, and of course, um, we can't keep you from logging off uh, if you have other things you want to go do. But I think we will maybe take another five minutes to get as many of these questions in as we can. Um, what was the name of the case out of LA that held that the union had the right to receive information regarding non-union members that were a part of the bargaining unit? That case is called County of Los Angeles versus the LA County Employee Relations Commission. It's a California Supreme Court case, and the case site is 56 Cal 4th 905. It's a 2013 California Supreme Court case. Thank you. Um, so if, if an agency allows the union access to countywide orientations, do they also have to allow the union access to departmental orientations for those same employees? No, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, if there's two different types of employee orientations, I mean, I think the argument here is, and this kind of also, once again, goes to that concept of structure, time, and manner. Um, I'd argue that, the, you know, you don't have to do this twice. I think you'd say, hey, if we have a, a one orientation, but the purpose of this is not to, for the union to be part of what we're providing from the orientation standpoint. The purpose of this law is for the union to be able to communicate with those uh, employees that are in the bargaining units that they represent, the employee associations. Um, that, that represent those employees. So if we provide them access at the, I guess, countywide, for example, orientation, and there's a mechanism or means, and we've agreed to that, we've met and conferred over that, I don't really think you'd have to do that again for a separate or department-guided uh, 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 orientation because that access has already been provided. We've already satisfied our obligations under the law. But keep in mind, these are the things that, that would come up in your meet and confer uh, discussions over that, that concept of structure, time, and manner, as I use it as noted in the law. There are a couple of different questions that have to do with whether a promotion, perhaps into a different department that would put them into a, an employee into a different bargaining unit counts as a new hire. So would the 30-day, 100-day rules still apply? Would the employee orientation for this 
person who was already an employee of the county but is now in a new bargaining unit, would, does that count as a new employee orientation? That's a great question. I, I don't think we're looking at promotions into a new group. Um, I mean, I'm looking at, so Government Code 3555.5, so this is one of the new codes, and this is, this is the definition of um, newly hired public employee. It says it means any employee, whether permanent, temporary, full-time, part-time, or seasonal, hired by a public employer to which this chapter applies and who is still employed as of the date of the new employer orientation. Now, when I hear the term hired, a promotion, you already are hired. So you're just being promoted. Um, and this depends too. Do you have your promoted employees go to a new employee orientation? Do they not? It is quite possible that a promotion may result in someone going from one bargaining unit to another bargaining unit now being represented by a different union or employee association. But I'm not so sure that, can, that, that would apply directly. This is more aimed at those who are actually being newly hired, so to speak, um, to your cities and counties, for example. So, in regards to the new employee information, are employees required to provide information that they do not currently collect? Uh, this agency does not make it mandatory to provide a personal cell phone number, so do they now have to request it from new employees, or do they only need to provide the data that they already collect? My understanding from how the law is, is written, it's only information that you actually have. Um, if we have name, job, title, uh, so, so name, job, title, department, work location, work home, personal cell phone, personal email address, it says on file with the employer. When that means on file, that means we actually have that information. If we haven't asked for that information, if it hasn't been provided, we don't require it to be provided, we don't have to provide that information um, to the recognized union or recognized employee association. In essence, if we have the information, we have to hand it over. If we don't, we're, we're not obligated to go seek it out, otherwise if it's not something that we have or intend to use. Uh, so when an agency gives the 10-day notice to the new employee orientation, do they also have to inform the unions or associations of their right to participate? Um, I think they have to, well, that's actually a good question. I'm not so sure they have to say, hey, we have to, you know, you have to participate to it. I'm looking at the code section, bear with me. So each public employer shall provide the exclusive representative mandatory access to its new employee orientations, which is, that goes to the meet and confer part. The exclusive rep shall receive not less than 10 days of notice in advance of an orientation. Um, it doesn't really say that means what to say you have to, you know, do you want to mean confer over this? They can request that. So I guess technically you can say, hey, we're going to have this new employee orientation. We're letting you know because the law requires it. And if that employer or organization or union says, well, we need to mean confer over that, or you already have done that, you follow that process. The biggest part where this is kind of a little bit iffy right now is the front end of this new law, now that it's in effect. Now that you are going to have new employer orientations, they could be tomorrow, they could be next month, next week. You know, until you do that meet and confer process, once you do and you have a process and policy in place, then you're going to follow that policy going forward along with that 10 days notice. It's the front end part that's a little bit interesting because we don't have to provide that access until we've agreed upon it through those timelines. I, I think practically speaking, that doesn't mean we don't do new employer orientations until you finish that meet and confer process. What it does mean is, once you've gone through that process, and there's a really short timeline, if they ask for that, let's say we give a notice today, and they say we don't want to meet, well, we have 60 days to reach an agreement, or we're going to an interest arbitrator, we're going to follow those procedures that they arise. It's a pretty short time frame. That would mean, roughly speaking, from today, you're probably going to have a, a new policy in place, whether it's agreed upon or imposed by an interest arbitrator by the end, the end of this year at the latest, but probably more like some point in the fall. All right, so there are still a number of questions. I'm just going to ask one more, which has to do with IHSS employees. Okay. Um, and if I can summarize the question, basically, does this new law apply to a IHSS employees? Um, some agencies um, provide orientations for prospective IHSS providers, um, you know, because, of course, of the differences between how IHSS employees are employed and who exactly is their employer uh, and the Welfare and Institutions Code already addresses union access to these orientations. So does AB 119 apply to that category of individuals? No, my understanding is no and, and I, I don't have those Welfare and Institution Code sections in front of me but I believe my, my understanding is there's already been orientation requirements or access to orientation requirements for your IHSS providers. Yeah, they're, they're a little bit unique um, 
in that they're nice, not technically employees, but they're providers and they have certain collective bargaining rights. And it's going to govern by sections within the Welfare and Institutions Code, in addition to potentially the MBA. Um, but this is this relates uh, more to your other public employees. They're already covered under those codes, is my understanding. All right. Well, we have gone considerably over our time. Thank you for answering so many of the questions. There are still some questions outstanding, so people can pass those along to us or their county council. Thanks to everyone for joining us today, and thank you very much, Gage, for sharing your considerable expertise with us today. Thank you, everyone.